So the last topic in equilibrium is going to be Le Chatelier's principle. Now, Le Chatelier was a Frenchman, and so therefore his name, I think the A gets one of those little hat things on top of it. I have no, no idea what the little hat is actually called. So um, those of you in French, I apologize. Okay, so Le Chatelier's principle says that an equilibrium system under stress will shift to absorb the effects of that stress. So while the language is complicated, what is actually happening is not. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, the last couple of days of the marking period, or especially the semester, like right before midterms and right before finals, you think about your workload. What do all of your teachers do? They all try to squeeze in one last project and one last test and one last homework assignment before the end of the marking period, before grades are due. Well, your body has a natural equilibrium. Well, all of a sudden, there's this new stress put on your life. It's all this extra work. So what do you do to absorb that stress? Okay, well, some of you are thinking, like, okay, do nothing. Like, just forget the homework, like, whatever. Uh, some of you sleep more. Some of you procrastinate more. Some of you work harder. Some of you sleep less. Some of you tend to, o some might overeat because of the stress. You know, there's a lot of things that you might do. But all of those changes, all of those things that you're doing, are all your body's way of trying to absorb the effects of this added stress, the stress of having all of this extra work. So there are four types of stresses. One, change in concentration. Two, change in pressure and volume. This is gases only. Change in temperature and the addition of a catalyst. Okay, so I'm gonna go through each one of these individually in order so that uh, I could talk about them more specifically. Now, what you have to remember about Le Chatelier's principle is it's actually not that hard as long as you follow the rules. If you start playing around with the rules, then you're gonna, if you, and if you don't learn the rules, you're never gonna understand Le Chatelier's principle. So, change in concentration. Adding more of a substance will cause the reaction to make more of whatever is on the opposite side. And, and then, of course, the reverse is true, too. Removing a substance will cause the reaction to make more of everything on that same side. So let's look at a chemical, uh, a chemical reaction. N2 plus 3H2 uh, is in equilibrium with 2NH3. Let's say I increase the concentration of N2. Okay, so the amount of that substance is going to go up. Well, now the addition of N2 is a stress on the system. Okay, the reaction, the equilibrium itself, remember this is at equilibrium, this is not initially. The equilibrium doesn't like the addition of the N2. So what does it do? It has to get back down to that ratio that's established by K. So what it's going to do is it's initially going to speed up in the forward reaction. Okay, and the amount of NH3 will now increase. Okay, and that's in order to use up the N2. Now, when that reaction in the forward direction speeds up, the H2 will get used up as well, and the H2 will start to decrease. Okay, now this is all initially. This is not a permanent shift. This is all what happens when we first add the N2. Okay. Now, let's take away some N2. So now the reaction says, whoa, I don't have enough N2, so I'm going to speed up in the direction of the N2 to get my N2 back. So what will happen is my H2 will increase and my NH3 will decrease in order to get more N2 because the NH3s are going to react faster in order to produce more of what's on the opposite side. Okay, now let's talk about changing volumes and pressures. This is the most important thing right there. It only affects gases. Volumes and so, uh, for solids and liquids don't change, okay? If you change them, like if you shrink the amount of solid you have, you also shrink the number of moles, so it doesn't really change anything. Plus, remember that liquids and solids are not in equilibrium. So since they're not in equilibrium, we don't really have to worry about how changing them will affect anything. Okay, so what you need to remember is collisions are what makes reaction happen. That goes back to some of the first things I said about equilibrium. You know, molecules must collide. They must collide with the right amount of energy. If I affect the number of collisions, I am going to change the reaction. Okay, so 
changing the volume and pressure actually doesn't affect the substances themselves because it doesn't change the amount of moles or you know, so how much I have, but it changes whether or not they collide. If I increase the pressure, this is the same thing as decreasing the volume. Okay, so if I increase the pressure, I am going to shove the molecules into a smaller area because I'm decreasing the volume. Well, when I do that, I'm going to increase the likelihood that a collision will occur. So those molecules are trapped in a smaller space. They're more likely to bump into each other. And when they bump into each other, they're going to react. And when they do, the reaction is going to... Now, the collisions are the stress. So what's happening here is... Because I've now increased the number of collisions, the reaction is going to shift so that there's less collisions, which means it's going to shift to the side with the fewest moles of gas because this only affects gases. Okay? So again, it shifts to the side with the fewest moles of gas. If I increase the volume, that means I'm decreasing the pressure. then I am decreasing the number of collisions. So if I have you know, a balloon that's 2 liters and I, I allow the balloon to increase to 10 liters, well, that's a huge difference. Now the molecules, and I haven't inserted any more molecules, well, now those molecules are much more spread out. The collisions have gone way down, and so therefore I need to increase the number of collisions. So the reaction shifts to the side with the more moles of gas. Okay, so here's a chemical reaction. Same thing I used before. N2 plus 3H2 yields 2NH3. So if I increase the pressure, the reaction is going to shift to the side with the fewest moles of gas, which would be this side. So an increase in pressure would increase my amount of NH3 and decrease the amount of N2 and H2 that I have in the reaction because there are two moles on the right but four moles on the left of gas. Okay. Now, something to be careful of and I guarantee you'll see something like this in the future, hint, hint, test, um, is they love to give chemical reactions that contain a solid as well as gases. For example, um, I'm trying to think of a good reaction. So here's a chemical reaction, and when you look at it, initially you're like, oh, the number of the moles are the same on both sides because you've got 1 and 1 equals 2. But notice that this guy is a solid, and so this one doesn't count. So it's actually got more moles on the, of gas on the right than there are on the left, and so pressure and volume will change the reaction. If the number of moles of gas are equal on both sides, then changing pressure and volume actually do nothing to the chemical reaction because the moles aren't different. Okay, let, now let's talk about temperature. Temperature change is different whether you're talking about an endothermic reaction or an exothermic reaction. And let me explain what the difference is. If the reaction is exothermic, that means heat is a product. Okay? Heat is being produced. It's being released in an exothermic reaction. Okay? So my heat is on the right-hand side. Now, since I know where the heat is, I'm going to treat it as if it was a chemical re in the chemical reaction. Okay, So now that goes back to changing concentration, which was letter A. So if I increase the heat, which direction is the reaction going to shift? Right, it's going to shift to the left. Correct. It's going to shift to the left to create more reactants because you're trying to use up the heat that was just added. So in other words, if you heat an exothermic reaction, it is, not, it is going to shift to the side with more reactants. Let me give you a for example. Okay? Freezing of water is exothermic okay? because heat is released to turn it into a solid. If I heat water, does it turn into, pro does it turn into ice faster? Ooh, no, it doesn't. It stays as water. And the water was my reactants. Okay? So when you heat a, if you heat water, it does not turn into ice at zero degrees Celsius, okay? Because freezing is an exothermic process. If the reaction is endothermic, well, now heat is a reactant. And again, you treat it just like changing uh, the concentration, but it's like changing the concentration of a reactant. 
So now, if I increase the heat, I'm going to shift the reaction to the right to produce more products. Let me give you another example. Melting of ice. Okay, So ice is my reactant. If I heat ice, what happens? Oh yeah, it melts faster. Okay, So the melting of ice is endothermic. If I heat it, I produce water. I produce water that much faster. And then if I stop heating it, it'll eventually come back to its equilibrium position, assuming that I'm doing it at um, zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so again, just treat heat like it was either a reactant or a product, depending on whether or not it's endothermic, and then just look at letter A and follow the rules for letter A. Okay, now here's the, here's the thing, the one thing about temperature that you need to know. I'm sorry, the one major thing about temperature you need to know. This is the only one in which K changes. Okay, so because unfortunately, temperature creates a permanent shift because when I heat something, it usually stays at the higher temperature. So if I t heat something at zero degrees Celsius and for you know five minutes, now it might be 20 degrees Celsius, it's hard for it to come all the way back down to zero. So, and if I did, then the temperature would change again, so it changes everything. So K this is the only one where K changes. Okay. Everything else, it's just changing the amounts of each substance. Uh, this is the only one that changes K. Okay, catalyst. Now, what you need, remember about a catalyst is, because we talked about it during kinetics, is it is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction but has no effect on the products. Okay. So all it does is make the reaction faster, but it doesn't change enthalpy. It doesn't change the, uh, how much product I'm going to have. It doesn't change the type of product I'm going to have. Nothing. Therefore, if the only thing it does is speed up the reaction, um, it's going to have no effect on equilibrium. Okay? And that's literally what you write. No effect. Catalysts are very easy to work with. Okay. Let's do an example. Consider the following equilibrium for which delta H uh, uh, with the ent enthalpy is less than zero. Oh, so if enthalpy is less than zero, is it endothermic or exothermic? Right, it's exothermic, so therefore the heat is over here. Important piece of information. Okay, how will each of the following affect an equilibrium mixture of the three gases? So they want to know will these substances be going up or be going down in concentration? O2 is added to the system. Now, when they talk about a substance specifically like O2, we ignore it in our answer. So I'm not going to talk about O2 in my answer. I'm only going to talk about the SO2 and the SO3. So this is a changing concentration situation. I've increased the amount of O2. The reaction will shift and speed up in to, the, to make more of the opposite side. So therefore, if it's making more of the opposite side, that means my SO3 will go up and the concentration of my SO2 will go down in order to use up the O2. Okay, so to use up the O2, the SO3 must increase. The reaction shifts to the right, speeds up to the right, <clears throat> makes more of the SO3, and uses up the SO2, so the SO2 goes down. The reaction mixture is heated. Okay, we just identified the reaction is exothermic. Heat's on the product side. Therefore, if I heat it, it will speed up towards the reactant side. It'll shift to the left. So my, the concentration of my SO2 will increase, the concentration of my O2 will increase, and the concentration of my SO3 will decrease. The volume of the reaction is doubled. Okay, so my volume is now much, much, much bigger. So a bigger volume means less pressure, which means less collisions. So the reaction is going to shift to the side, it's going to speed up in the direction, of the psi with the most moles of gas. Okay, well the most moles of gas, let's see, we've got 2 plus 1 is 3 versus 2. So the most moles of gas is the left hand side, so it, this will be SO2 will increase, O2 will increase, and SO3 will decrease. A catalyst is added to the mixture. What did I tell you to write? No effect the total pressure of the system is increased by adding a noble gas okay this is a trick question okay mark this trick question they can use the word noble they might also use the word inert 
Do you remember what inert means? Oh uh, yeah, non-reactive. If I put something into a reaction that's non-reactive, is it going to do anything to the reaction? Nope. Therefore, no effect. This one is a trick question. Be careful. A lot of people think, oh, I'm adding more gas, therefore my pressure is going to increase. But it's a misconception. If you take a gas, a new gas, and insert it into a container at the same pressure as the, old, as the other gases, pressure doesn't change. It's only when you insert it at a different pressure that things happen. OK, and the last one. SO3 is removed from the system. So again, I decrease the concentration of my SO3. When I decrease the concentration, it, the reaction is going to speed up to the side that I took away from. So therefore, my SO2 will, oops, will decrease. My O2 will decrease. Now the reason I don't talk about the other th substance that I took away from is there's no way to determine whether or not that substance has increased back to its original amount or increased beyond its original amount. So, or it's increased, but it still hasn't even reached the original amount. So since there's no way to determine one way or the other, we just ignore it in our answer. Okay? And that's the Chatelier's principle.